Okay, so welcome to our third night of the Women's Series. My name is julie and I'll be your host for the evening, which is fun for me. So great to have you all here. Just got a little bit of housekeeping to do. So somebody left this here last week. Is that anybody that's here tonight that left their notes in a book? Nobody recognises that? Okay. Just put that to the side. So, um, we're going to be talking about women in leadership tonight, and Julie Wilson Reynolds will be our speaker, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, well, I just wanted to also remind you that next week is the last week of our series, and we'll be going up to Mount Kembla, um, which will be great, and it will really suit our theme, which is intimacy with God. And so we're going to be hearing from some women um, about their relationship with God and also about some resources and also have our own time to just be quiet with God together, but on our own, if you know what I mean, have your own quiet moment. Um, and because it is, uh, there's no car park up there, so we'll all be parking on Cordo Road. So just, I guess, be mindful of maybe keeping some of those spots sort of right out the front of the church for anyone that is a little bit less able on their feet or some of our senior ladies. And if you're able to carve a pool, that might work better too. Um, I've been told that if all of the, the main um, spots on Porto Road are filled up, then James Street is the side street that we'll be to park in. So just a little bit about that. Um, so back to tonight. So I'm very excited because um, I've had the privilege of knowing Julie for about 20 years, I think, uh, I figured out. And our husbands go back to being little boys together and, and naughty. They actually got kicked out of Sunday school together <laughs> while Julie's husband, David's mother, was running the Sunday school. <laughs> so they go back a long way. Um, so I've grown to really appreciate and admire Julie more with the passing of time. I'm going to embarrass her now. And I think the thing that I love about her most is her heart for other people. And uh, she cares deeply, not just for her own family and friends, but for anyone who comes in her orbit. She can't sit on the sidelines if there's a problem to be solved or a person to be advocated for. Um, so I could go on more and more, but I'm actually going to ask her to come up and we're going to have a bit of a chat. So welcome up, Julie. That was the day John got his PhD. Um, he did a, a doctorate in privacy and metadata. And he's a smart boy. And that's my beautiful girl, Steph. And she has just finished a Master's of Social Work and has given up a very well paid job with the government to take a pay cut to be a social worker. Yeah. And that's John on his graduation day, and that's my Steph rocking the, I'm shaving my hair off for charity, Mum. And I'm going, oh, don't, don't do that. And then we met her for lunch, and she came bowling up, and David just looked at her and said, you look hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was all over, and she's got a short hair now. So Julie, tell us about a recent day you really enjoyed it, why? So, but how funny is this? David and I took some, uh, I work at a school, and we took some kids to Cambridge because they wanted to do some courses there, as they do. And we had a day trip where we just went to Ely Cathedral. I don't know if you've been there. We, we didn't know what we'd find. And we turned up, and here are these Morris dancers. I have never seen anything like it. 
We laughed and laughed. I sat down with one of the women that we'd sat and talked to them so long that she actually invited me to join them. She said, would you like to dance? I said, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking anywhere in Australia who men would put flowers in their hats and skip in circles holding their hands, they'd get beaten to a pulp. And we ended up having lunch in an English pub with the Morris Downs. It sounds fabulous. Uh, sounds fabulous. Um, and what's the best book you've read in the past year and what was it you loved about? Yeah, that, this was the hardest question out of all of them because I <laughs> loved reading and I read lots. But I'm going to tell you one that I didn't love reading, but it, was, it still sticks with me. So Peter Fitzsimmons, um, who's an interesting man and might be annoying to some, but he, um, he wrote Burke and Wills. He wrote a story of Burke and Wills. And I read it and it was horrible. Uh, and you know how it ends. It doesn't end well. And there was a lot of starvation, and there was a lot of mistakes, there was a lot of missed opportunities, and there was a lot of death. And I couldn't stop reading it, and it's really stuck with me because I think life is not always easy, and life doesn't always go as you want. And this was a book that actually showed that when you're really driven, sometimes you miss the obvious. And I sometimes need to hear that. Wow. I think I'll read it now. <laughs> um, and tell us what you believe about Jesus. Well, <laughs> um, when I went to a Catholic school, and when I was at school, everyone uh, believed they were uh, Christian, uh, but I was different because I, I didn't have that Catholic faith. So I started exploring that. When I went to university, um, I struggled with the fact that I thought I couldn't work up enough faith. I thought, I don't have enough faith. Um, so I studied ancient history, and I studied with a lot of very um, fabulous ancient historians who had Christian faith. And I questioned them and I queried it. And at the end of the day, I decided, or I came to understand that Jesus actually really lived and died and uh, the historical uh, information about him was so strong that I actually had to make a decision. It was either real and true or not. And it didn't really matter how I felt. So I actually made the decision to say, actually, I really believe he did come and die for the sins of the world and he was offering me something. And I took it up. So I believe he's my saviour. And it's as simple as that. It's great. Yeah. So we've got a little clue already that Julie's an educator, so I just want you to share with us a little bit about your career trajectory. I'll talk a bit more about this, but you know how people have ladders? They, their careers are like ladders and you climb each rung. That is not my life. <laughs> my life is a jungle gym. My career has been a jungle gym and I've kind of climbed up and back and down and around and I've enjoyed it. So here's, here's my career in a nutshell. I became a Christian at university, so I did a year as assistant chaplain. I came to Wollongong to work at St Joseph's High School, that was my first teaching job, and came to Fig Tree Anglican Church because the seats were more comfortable than uh, the, the cathedral in um, town, and then Angela and others, anyway. Um, then I became, um, I left my job to do youth work here at Fig Tree Anglican Church. And then I missed teaching too much, so I did both for a while. And then I became a head of English. And then I became a deputy at a school in Sydney at Roseville College. And then I came back to Wollongong and worked as an English teacher at St Mary's. And then I became principal of Cedars Christian College. Then I went off to be deputy at Abbotsley. Then I became principal at a school in Queensland called St Hilda's. And then I came back to teach at St Mary's again. And now I'm deputy um, at Barker uh, College. And I've got a photo of that for you. This is my school now. Um, I'm one of three deputies. I'm in charge of academic care. If you want a dream job, that's my dream job. And it's a very huge campus in uh, Hornsby. But we also have three indigenous campuses. Uh, two in the Central Coast and one in Arnhem Land. And uh, that's uh, a picture from our Arnhem Land campus. 
and I could talk all night about that. So I'll stop at that point. It is an exciting school. It is fabulous, and that could be another night. You might have to get them back. <laughs> so, Julie, God has clearly given you the gift of leadership. So when you look back on that journey, who were the people who encouraged you in ways that were meaningful for you, and how did they do that? I think a lot of it goes back to my dad, who sadly passed away uh, when I was 21, just after I became a Christian. Um, he believed in me, and he thought I could do anything, and... Uh, I, I think that's really important if you have children, if you have daughters, it's really important that they understand that um, their dads believe in them. So he was my, probably my first influence. Second uh, was really at college when I became a Christian. Dr. Paul Barnett was the master of the college that I lived in. And because my dad was dying, he was actually a really uh, special influence on my life. And I would credit a lot of my Christian development to uh, Paul Barnett. Um, I've also worked with lots of talented people, and I could mention a lot of them. Um, but also, my husband David is probably um, my biggest influence. He believes in me, like even when it defies logic, he thinks I can do anything. <laughs> and it's probably quite American, really. Um, I actually think he could do anything, and so we have this lovely connection like that. So when you married David, did you discuss how your careers would take shape together? You want to see? That's it. Well, how gorgeous is that? And on the left there, might be Julianne's husband, our best man. There you go, a very young uh, Peter Jones and uh, David Reynolds. Did we discuss it? Look, I was very independent. I was closer to 30 than 20 when we got married, and so was he. So I was really quite independent. Um, so we kind of negotiated all of that. The irony was David had lived at home for 27 years before we started going out. And uh, he wasn't going to go anywhere because his mother did everything for him. And the week before we started going out, he moved to Sydney. How funny is that? And he lived in a share house. Um, so that's hilarious. So we talked about our careers and our careers have evolved commuting. Uh, I've had jobs in Sydney and uh, done the commute and then we lived in Sydney and he worked here at the University of Wollongong and he, and he commuted. So we've kind of had a sense of give and take and a sense of um, making sure that, you know, we, we make compromises for each other. But when we moved to Queensland, he gave up his job for me and he said, yep, I'll support you. Now before you get feel sorry for him, he had you know, almost three years riding his bike on the Gold Coast, being a kept man. So he had a ball. Um, so there's been some give and take and lots of opportunities. Yeah. I think you've kind of answered the next question, but did you, was it something that you were scared about when you got married and you thought, how's this going to play out with my career? Because, so, you know, that was really important to you. Did you, were you worried about that or did you meet him and know that that wasn't going to be an issue? Yeah. I was going to say you don't mess with me, but that sounds really <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we just knew it would work. Yeah. So what would you say to our young women about how to talk about their ambitions and dreams with their maybe partners or their future partners and husbands? Don't marry anyone unless they believe in you and don't marry them unless you believe in them. And then it's simple. You just... Work that out together. Wow. Um, and I've loved watching da David absolutely delight in Julie's achievements. Like, I remember when you had when you had your PhD party that we went to, and he was just, he almost couldn't read these reviews about her PhD because he was just so excited. So it's always been lovely to see that he just loves being your biggest cheer squad in the background. Now, I'm going to get off the stage and let Julie talk some more. So, let's give her a clap. <laughs> Start with a little bit.
bit of a story for you. Um, when I was principal, so I was, is that close enough? When I was principal at Cedars Christian College, which is not far from here, um, I was invited to join the, a national uh, education body. It was um, uh, a body that was overseeing education across Australia and there was about six people on the board and I was invited to be on that board. Uh, I think at the time I knew of one other woman, the rest were all men and uh, I'd been principal for a couple, maybe two years and I was invited uh, by the chair of the board to join that. That's great. I went up to my first meeting and I didn't know everyone, and I thought this would be great. I'll get to know all the members of the board. So I walk in, I was a bit early, so there's the obligatory table of coffee and tea, and the principals are coming in and they're talking to each other and slapping each other on the back and saying, hey, go, mate, and all that. And I'm standing at the coffee table, and one of them came up to me and he said, uh, hi. And I said, hi, I haven't met you. My name's Joy. And I put up my hand. He put out his hand, he said, hi, oh, whatever, whatever his name was. And he said, oh, do you work out the back? <laughs> I said, no, I'm a principal and I'm on the board. Leadership, women in leadership. It's not always an easy thing and I'm not going to gild it tonight. I'm not going to tell you all the, the fabulous things. But there are challenges as a woman in leadership and... Um, I want to say that I've made sense of my journey as a, as a woman leader uh, because it's been informed by my faith in Christ. And my faith has moulded all my experiences, uh, all my interests. And I recognise that in this room there will be all manner of different experiences. And you will come with your own journey, your own experiences, the own, your own uh, thoughts and, and you, your own interests. Um, and I hope during the night we can share some of that together. Uh, and I'm hoping that during the night we'll have time and opportunity to talk to one another. So let me start with the sense of, um, oh, I should have uh, Leadership. Leadership's not a title. It's not a badge. It's not an achievement. And it's not a position of power. I believe that the best definition of Christian leadership is that you influence others for good. Let me say that again. I think leadership is about influencing others for good. It is always relational, and that's why I believe women are really good at it. And as a Christian, I firmly believe that true leadership raises others So, my story of leadership is obviously centred around education. That's been where I've worked, that's been my life. Now, your experience might be very different. And I imagine in this room there are women who have led in all different capacities and all different uh, uh, spheres. And it might be at work where you're a leader. It might be in your home, in your family that you're a leader. It might be here in the church that you are a leader. But leadership is relational, it's focused on raising people up and influencing others for good. Okay, because we're an Anglican church here, I think I have three main points to make tonight. <laughs> Firstly, uh, I think as women in leadership, we need three qualities to survive. Firstly, confidence. We need to know our worth. We need to be bold to take a seat at the table. And we need to be aware of the strengths that we as women bring into the realm of influencing others for good. Secondly, fortitude. I love that word, fortitude. Fortitude, there will be setbacks. That's a given. And facing challenges can sharpen us. But we also need to support one another because sometimes fortitude is not enough and we don't, we run out. And thirdly, meaning. 
So I know that this series that you've organised is about transforming your mind, being salty. I believe God gives each of us interests and passions. And if we keep in step with him, he will provide what we need to pursue them. A former boss and dear friend with an, who was an incredible leader would regularly send me text messages which would say, you go girl. And maybe I could just say, you go girls, and sit down, and that would be enough. Uh, but let's begin with confidence. I just love that. I found that on um, the internet. You know, the tightropes, and the man is walking on the tightrope, and the woman is hanging on for dear life. So just picture the beach. I don't know if you've been to the beach recently. This is my image of the beach. I go there, I lie on the beach, and I'll, if no one's looking, take off the t-shirt, my swimmers and I think, okay, that's in sun, I've got to get into the water, okay, I'll put something around me, I'll run down to the water, I'll get in the water and I'll get back to my towel as quickly as I can. Yeah. You do that? You been there? Yeah. You watch the men? Sorry, mm -hmm. You watch the men? <laughs> Doesn't matter what swimwear they've got, as you know, the budgie smugglers or whatever, and they walk down the beach like they own it, and they don't mind and they might not have the perfect figure, but they don't care because they know they look good. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it like this? Why do we as women care or worry about who we are and what we're presenting? It, it, I don't understand it, but it's true. I have overseen recruitment interviews for years, and uh, at the moment I'm involved in quite a lot of them. And I got an email from someone who works in my school, a lovely man, nothing wrong with him. But he sent me this email and he said, Dear Julie, blah, 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 uh, I just want to let you know I'm an excellent leader. And I read it. And I thought, well, no woman I know would write that. I would no more write in an email, I'm an excellent leader. It wouldn't even occur to me to write that. Whether it's conditioning, stereotyping, or just years of being asked if you work out the back, we are less confident to put ourselves forward. We often present a tentative approach and feel pressure to prove our competence. When Julianne rang me and said, would you like to do this? Oh, but I don't think I've got anything to say. And what could I say? Oh, you could be better people than me. It's a reality that many women are overlooked and underrepresented at the leadership table. Here are some statistics, you know some of them. Chairs of boards, 17% are women. Ch CEOs of companies, 19.4% are women. Key management roles, 34.5% are women. Women are, my daughter wanted me to say this tonight, women are overrepresented in industries that have lower pay, mum. You tell them that. <laughs> yes, Steph, I will. I could go on, I actually have quite a lot of stats, but you know them, they're, they're not great. Now, although my experience of leadership is in education, I think that sphere is probably a little more forgiving than, than some. But I have also felt a glass ceiling. Now, girls' schools have a better reputation uh, in promoting women's leadership, but I've been a principal and a deputy in co-ed schools. I'm in mean, one now. And it's not as common for women to be appointed to higher roles. I'm going to boast a little bit. My principal um, uh, is fabulous. Uh, Philip Heath, if you know of him, he's an extraordinary man. He has three deputies. They're all women. I love that. Um, some years ago, I was invited uh, to what was called the Heads of Independent Coeducational Schools, HICES. And it was a conference, and they were holding their conference in the Hunter Valley. And I thought, oh, this looks interesting. And I looked through the program, and I thought, yeah, I like the look of that. And then I turned the next page, and it said, all principals, you, you know, it would be good for you to know that while the conference is going on, your wives will have the opportunity of going shopping. <laughs> <laughs> not only did I not have a wife. <laughs> But anyone who knows David would know he'd rather put pins in his eyes than go shopping. <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't attend that conference. Uh, more, more recently, 
I actually was part of the recruitment for a principal position and it was of great interest to me. Uh, but on being offered the role and uh, told what the remuneration would be, I declined the role. I know what the role's worth, I know how much it takes of your life, and I turned it down. Uh, they were quite surprised. I found out later, having turned it down, that I had been offered one third less pay than the man who was currently doing the job when I was offered the role. That's important. Add to this the interview process. When considering roles that involve leadership, I and other women, women I know have been asked about how my husband will feel about me taking on this role how my children will cope with me doing the role, and how will I juggle home life and leadership? I've been asked that. I think the world is changing. It's actually illegal now to go down some of those paths, but that's been part of my story. Uh, and I guarantee you that men are not asked those questions. So women, we've had to prove our worth. I want to change the narrative here and encourage us, as women, to know our worth. In Psalm 139, verse 14, the Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Everyone in this room is fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made and crafted by the God of the universe. You are awesome. And that verse is not gender specific. Now, there are some fabulously strong and capable women leaders in the Bible. You will know them. We also know that history is full of women, particularly Christian women, who have influenced others for good in ways that have changed the world. And I think of my, uh, the women, one of the women who most inspired me, who say, you go, go. Our gifts, our skills and our talents are worth celebrating. So last week, uh, in my role <coughs> as uh, Deputy Principal of Academic Care, I gathered together 11 girls who are the best and brightest in maths at Barker College. I'd been told that all 11 had declined to take up extension to maths. They weren't sure they could do it. So we had lunch together. Unlike their male peers, they were nervous. I asked them, we just sat in a big circle, and I asked them, what do you love about maths? And their eyes all lit up, and they talked about maths. Uh, I asked them what they enjoyed and how it was different in class for the boys, and they talked about the boys being really competitive, and that that didn't kind of work for them, and that they felt the pressure when the boys are competitive, and they might not win, so they pull back. I said, well, how, how does it work for you? And they said, oh, we like it when we collaborate. We like when we can share. We like when we can help each other, when we can look at difficult problems together. And I said, well, can you do that? And they said, absolutely, we can. I said, well, should you do that? And they said, yeah, we should. I found out this week that all 11 are taking extension to maths. Yes. <laughs> now, I've said to them, you might just take it for a turn, and you might decide it's not for you. That's OK. But give it a go. You will never know it unless you try it. They just need to know their worth. So my beautiful daughter, with a beautiful show head, and I have shared many conversations about women in leadership, and I'm incredibly proud of her. This week she's taken a real risk in her career by walking away from the secure job, I think I mentioned, to take up a more challenging role. And she wants to be a social worker, so that she can influence others for good. I found this mug in a shop. I was going for a walk, and I found that. And I bought it for her, and uh, she's coming up to stay with us, and I put it on the bed. Uh, I know that she's taken on this role because she believes she could change the world. My very dear friend Angela is sitting here in the audience. And uh, a little while ago, uh, 
when I was probably applying for a job or thinking about my PhD, I remember she looked at me and she said, Julie, why do you do this? <laughs> why do you do this? Wouldn't it be easier just to keep doing what you're doing? Why do you do this? And I don't remember saying it, but she tells me that I said, because I can. <laughs> So when I did graduate with my PhD, Angela gave me a beautiful set of glasses and on one of the glasses it just says, because I can, engraved in the glass. I don't know if I've told Angela this, but uh, when we came back to Wollongong after a setback in our lives, I slipped and I broke the glass and shattered in pieces on the floor and I thought, the irony of that. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, I still think I can. So believing that we can make a difference, that we can accept challenges and have capacity to influence others for good is something we should encourage one another in. And I want to say, let's have more you go girl moments. So I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to give five minutes and I want you to share with people. Now, you might have come with someone you know. If that's the case, this will be really easy. If you haven't come with someone you know, this will be even more exciting because you'll learn someone, about someone that you didn't know. If anyone's sitting on their own, make sure you look out for them and include them. I want you to share with each other a time when you knew your worth, when you felt confident to take a risk. And if you sit there and say, oh, I don't have any of those moments, I want to say, think again, come on. A time when you actually did take a risk and thought, yeah, I actually can do this. Uh, and or a time when you thought, I know I can influence someone else for good, and I'm going to do that. Your five minutes go. <laughs> <laughs>
or your best efforts, things go wrong and challenges come your way. Therefore, I think the second leadership trait that we as women need is to embrace fortitude. It's a great word. It means courage in pain or adversity. And I think as women who are um, tasked to be in the next generation and go through childbirth, you are masters. We are masters of fortitude. <laughs> Uh, in the uh, interview, uh, Julianne asked me if I had fears and, uh, about giving up things in my leadership journey. Absolutely. Lots of moments that have been difficult. So let me share with you a couple of m moments in my journey where I've had to have fortitude. Uh, some years ago when our children were in primary school, I was offered a role of Deputy Pastoral Care at Rosewood College. And it's a lovely girls' school on the North Shore of Sydney. Uh, our first plan was to relocate. We were going to move. Uh, but where we needed to live for school and work for both of us, the real estate uh, probably demanded a cool a million dollars, and we didn't have that money. Uh, the thought of renting uh, and, and being vulnerable in that sense was difficult. Um, and we had the support of grandparents. We had music teachers, this church, friends, and our children were wrapped up in a beautiful um, uh, bubble of care, and we knew it was a big cost. So we made the very difficult decision that I would commute to Roseville and stay up there two or three nights a week. And it was really tough. It was a difficult time. Um, the first morning I left home, so I would usually leave on a Monday morning at about 5am. And uh, we had a car phone, and I did uh, Suzuki music practice with my kids on that car phone. Uh, you don't know what you can do on a car phone until you try. But one morning the, rang, uh, the phone rang, and it was about 7, I was still driving, and there were tears. Mommy, Daddy can't do my hair. He doesn't know how to do my hair. Steph was in, inconsolable. Uh, lots of chaos, lots of tears, and I think some of them were probably David's as well. Um, <laughs> let me balance uh, this story with another image. One night, I'm staying in my little granny flat, which is out the back of a, a house that uh, I was renting. And uh, I was feeling really guilty. I thought, oh, my, ch my children, they'll be missing me terribly. And my husband, I'm here in Sydney, and what are we doing? And I felt bad. And it was 8 o'clock, and I thought, oh, they'll be just gone to bed. I'll ring them. Well, I rang. There was lots of laughter. <laughs> there was lots of commotion. There was loud music. I said, what are you doing? They all went silent, all three of them. <laughs> I said, what's happening? John was put on the phone. Well, Mum, we didn't have any ice cream. We've come down to Woolies and we're, we're running through the aisles and we're going to get tubs of ice cream. We're going to go home and we're going to eat it all. <laughs> and apparently it had been noted in the aisle of Woolies that if Mum was here, we'd never be allowed to do this. <laughs> After three years of community, uh, the four of us agreed it hadn't been ideal. Uh, both David and I had been praying about what role would be next. What would we do? And it was no easy answer. I loved my job, uh, but I equally loved my children, and we equally loved our life together. So the maths was easy. Three people in a secure, happy place, and one living away, I resigned. And the wretch was really great. Um, at the time of making that decision, I was uh, reading Daily Bread, I think it was, the Bible notes, and David was reading something else. And we both at the same time uh, fell upon this passage from Jeremiah 17, 17. And it says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water, that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. 
And we both knew that we needed to trust God and put our confidence in him. And so we stepped out in faith and I resigned. Now, people who know me well and I'm driven and I love to do things, to walk away from a really wonderful job was difficult. It was really big. And I applied for a number of roles, so in the decision made, you know, in two thirds of the way through the year that I was resigning, I applied for lots of jobs and didn't have any success. We turned back to Jeremiah and we clung to the message that if we remain rooted in Christ, we would find the source of hope we needed and we would still bear fruit even when it looked without possibility, even if it was a year of drought. So I moved back to Wollongong and I took up a teaching role at St Mary's. And all the while I was praying, this was a very specific prayer, praying for a leadership position in a school close to home. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat that year and say it was all unicorns and roses, it wasn't. I had moments where being uh, local narrowed the jobs that I could apply for. And we'd done the commute thing and we decided not to move. So I really struggled with stepping aside from that job that I loved. Uh, and I was reading the book of Job at the time, won't that tell you everything? Um, yeah, I could bring in my journals, they're not pretty, but anyway. We continued to pray for a leadership position close to home. God has a great sense of humour. It was almost precisely one year to the day when I was invited to be principal of Cedars Christian College. You can see that school from our letterbox. <laughs> a leadership position close to home. Fortitude is courage in pain or adversity. Now, there have been other moments of loss and pain in my career. Uh, a very different scenario unfolded for us in Queensland, where I was principal of St Hilda's. Now, there were very different reasons, and I needed, again, to make a really difficult decision to leave my role as principal. Uh, to share the details of that would take longer than I have with you tonight, uh, but because it was very painful, and required great fortitude, I know I have learned a lot about myself from it. So what have I learned while exercising my fortitude muscles? Firstly, our identity, particularly as women, must never be wrapped up in our career. It's a dumb thing. Don't wrap up your sense of worth in your leadership role or your title. It's not yours to own. They are given for a time. I began my talk by asserting that leadership is not a prize or a badge or an identity. I know that better than anyone. I've lived it. And sometimes the ideas of ambition, career, leadership can all be equated with having arrived. I've arrived. I've won something. That's a really dangerous perspective and one which we as women should be fooled by. Leadership is not about winning, it's about giving. It's about influencing others for good. And you and I can do that wherever we are and whatever we are doing. One more imperative for me, and I said this earlier, I describe my career as a jungle gym. I've climbed up and across and down and around, and it's been fun, exhausting, exhilarating and instructive. What I've learned in the challenging times is that as we're on our gym, we need to lift each other up. We need to help each other on the gym that we're on. I have been supported and helped and counselled by some amazing I have also had the privilege to encourage and mentor and grow other women both in and outside the schools in which I've worked. So if we do accept that leadership is influencing others for good, why don't we seize the opportunity to do that with one another? So I'm going to give you two minutes, and this is to reflect, not to talk, to reflect. I want you to reflect on who is lifting you in your jungle gym. Who is encouraging you to climb? And I don't mean climb 
to gain something but to climb to give. Who's encouraging you? If you could think of two or three women, that would be great. And then the second question that I want you to reflect on is who are you lifting? Who are you helping? You've got two minutes. Ponder. And there'll be an awkward silence in the room. <laughs> Just thinking, I want to encourage you that I wonder how many of you are being named in the minds of other women who are in this room. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were many. My third point find your me, find your why. Uh, in recruitment or performance interviews, I often ask people what lights up your eyes? What brings you joy? What do you love doing? And it's a really great question when you're trying to get to understand someone. I remember my first job, as I said, at St Joseph's Albion Park, teaching English. And I felt like a fraud. I remember thinking, they're paying me to read books and share what I found about those books with people. I would do that for free. <laughs> I would do that for fun. Why would you pay me to do that? I loved it. I find an absolute delight in seeing young people come to a better understanding of literature, ideas, the world, and themselves. It's what I do. I love it. I love working with teachers and educational leaders to craft programs, systems, frameworks in ways that bring excellent outcomes. I love encouraging others to do better give more, set and achieve goals, and find their strengths and use them. I cheer on my students when they debate, when they play music, when they create art, when they train in sport, when they serve others. I love it. I work very long days. <coughs> it's not unusual for me to have a 15 or 16 hour day at school, and it's usually six days a week and I have meetings and events during my school holidays, and I do it because I can. But more importantly, I do it because I love it. Now, it's said that people can do almost anyhow if they know their why. Now, whether that's Simon Sinek or uh, Victor Frankl, I think Victor Frankl might have said it first. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Victor Frankl. <coughs> If you've not heard about him, he's a survivor of the Holocaust. And he's written a book, and it's really short, and it's a great read. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. Now, uh, he survived the Holocaust, and he uh, is a psychologist, or was a psychologist, who explored the importance of understanding what gives you meaning. Now, he actually suffered for years in the hell of Auschwitz. And he observed that those who saw meaning or a meaningful reason to survive lived longer than those who didn't. On the arrival to uh, Auschwitz, he was wearing a big coat. And in that coat were all his research papers that he'd spent years putting together in putting together what he called logotherapy, which is the um, uh, logo means meaning. 
who is talking about helping people understand the importance of meaning uh, when thinking about their mental health. And he had all his papers in his coat and thought this would be safe. First thing that happens when you get to Auschwitz, they take his coat. And he watched his coat being taken away. He talks about the fact that he was given another coat, uh, another coat, and in the pocket of that coat was a passage from the Old Testament that was a prayer. Anyway, he took that in his uh, stead and he realised, I have the ideas in my head. I don't need the papers. I need to survive to get out here to write <coughs> them. He had a meeting and he survived Auschwitz. His survival had meaning. So I want to ask you a question. What gives you meaning? I've shared with you that my meaning in life comes from helping others to learn and grow. That's what lights up my eyes. It's a powerful driver for me and I'm wired to want to influence others for good. But I'm also a Christian who believes that knowing, loving and serving God in my life gives me an even more profound meaning. I'm incredibly fortunate to have a job where I can talk about my faith. I spoke in chapel to you seven uh, two weeks ago and I do that regularly and that's a joy. I've been able in every leadership position I've ever had to share my faith and I probably wouldn't work in a school where I couldn't. I think that makes my leadership even more excellent than it might have been. And maybe one day, like my colleague in the email, I might be bold enough to say, I'm an excellent leader. <laughs> so I want to ask you, what gives you a life meaning? What is your why? No two of us will have the same answer. I want you to reflect on it and to own it. So if I go from the wisdom of Viktor Frankl, to the wisdom of another great philosopher of the 21st century, Dolly Parton. <laughs> she said, find out who you are and then do it on purpose. <clears throat> who am I? I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a Christian, I'm a teacher, I'm a learner, and I think that photo shows quite a bit of that. If I've encouraged you at all to know your worth, to bring your fortitude to challenges, and to find your meaning, then I hope it's been an hour well spent. Actually, Julie's been very timely. She's actually finished early. So I'm, I might run around with this microphone if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask Julie. Does anyone just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question? That'd be hard, thanks. Hi Julie, I just have a question and I'm not sure if it's an easy answer but I'm going to throw it to you anyway. Um, how do you uh, cope or how have you dealt with staff um, in whatever realm you've been in um, who maybe don't see the potential that you see in them? And I'm, I'm a big believer in not believing things for others that they don't have for themselves. But how do you grow capacity in people where you see things that they may not see for themselves? Yeah, great. Um, I think it all comes back down to encouragement. Um, that's something that I... counterintuitive to boast. I think I'm a great encourager. And I actually look for opportunities to tell people uh, what they do well. So, here's a little story that I'll tell you about. Um, I uh, had the opportunity, because we came down a little bit earlier, to go and get the roots done in my hair, in my hairdresser, because she lives in Wollongong and I live in Sydney. So I got my hair done today. I love my hairdresser. I think she's awesome. 
But I watch her, and I watch her every time I go there. And she works the room. And by that I mean she looks after everyone in the room. Uh, a young man who probably, you know, had some challenges in his life came in, she welcomed him like he was the king. An older woman was getting her hair done in the old-fashioned perm way. She looked after her with a walker. She rang her husband to come and get her. She helped her to the door. She did everything. She calmed her down because she was worried where the husband was. She was getting in a state. She's calming her down. She's doing someone's perm. She's doing this. She's doing that. And she said, what are you doing today? I said, well, I'm talking at Victory Anglican Church. One of women in leadership. She, she laughed. She said, I think I might come. She's not here. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, I've been watching you. And she said, pardon? Yeah. I said, I've been watching you all day. You have been, because she said, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, the three things. And she said, I said, you've been doing this all day. I have watched you with that man. I've watched you with that girl. I've watched you with that woman. You are an awesome leader. And you are running this shop. And you are teaching the young women that work under you how to do this. And how to work for others for you. <coughs> and she went, oh. Yeah, that's that's what I do. I think you need to take opportunities to watch people and to actually give them specific feedback on what they're doing. Because I think often we're not aware of what we do. And that comes from that strengths-based leadership model that I love. Look for strengths, don't look for weaknesses. And again, that's what women often do. We look for the gaps. We look at, I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, what can you do? What are the strengths? And we need to say that to one another more often. Because that's really important. And that's what you do as a teacher. That's a great question. <laughs> I was going to ask you a little bit more if you could share a little bit more about faith and how that, um, yeah, how, you know, your faith inspires you and I don't know, how do you press it to God? Do you want to share yeah, sure. a little bit about that? Oh, as a woman, I used to say, well, not enough. Um, <laughs> God has been a support, has been a guide, uh, uh, making hard decisions are easier when you understand a bigger purpose. I think it goes to that third point about meaning. Um, I can make lots of meanings, but if I know there's an internal meaning, if there is a real um, bigger picture for my life, that's easy. And all the other little decisions are so little in comparison. So maybe it's about perspective, that being understanding where I stand with God is giving me perspective. And that's really helpful in leadership, because if you lose perspective, then you become something that actually isn't helpful. Anyone else? <coughs> Julie, you gave a few examples of when um, as a woman, you've not been treated equally to men, or any men that respect us to that conference, and you decided not to go. Um, there's been many examples that you've had. I wonder um, uh, how often you've called that out and said something. So, with the conference, did you give them feedback, or when the, you've ended up at the pay scale, the, the current principle? Um, so, sometimes you might, like, I don't know, sometimes you, maybe you leave it, sometimes you call it out. How do you do that? How do you do that well? Not without seeming like that. Yeah. I'd love to say I always do it so well. I've probably had my moments where I say, that's appalling! <laughs> um, I often don't call it out, and I'm just now trying to think that through. Why don't I call it out? I probably call it out by teaching young women to think differently. I, I'm probably calling it out by meeting with 11 girls who have decided not to do extension maths. That's how I'm calling it out. I'm trying to change it rather than just say that's not good enough. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the world is changing, and I think my, my daughter is probably proof of that. Um, we we sit and talk uh, about women and leadership, and uh, we've had lots of heated discussions, uh, lots of wonderful discussions, um, and I learned from her. Um, I don't know everything, um, and I think sometimes uh, calling it out, you can sound angry, um, and, and saying things in anger never works. It, it actually just doesn't work. 
But if you can say it in a way that's constructive and brings change, uh, I think me knocking back that wall was significant and that's me calling it out. It came at a cost, but I called it. Did you have a computer of a uh, I'll take the job. Take the job. Oh, oh yeah, lots. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think um, I would probably, in my wiser moments, circle back and have calm, pleasant conversations later about, you know, did you realise this is how it sounded? Um, and that's a better way to do it. And I've probably had moments where I've done that. Not perfect. <laughs> um, hearing what you're just saying, then it sounds like it's actions more than just words. Yeah, yeah. I'm learning that. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to ask about the mum guilt, like hearing, you know, those phone calls and all of that. How did you not get in the car and just? drive two hours to Woolworths and join them in their hunt for ice cream. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. There were moments, I, I remember being here at church and a very dear friend, not here tonight, actually said, how can you do this, Joy? How can you leave your children? I, she actually was worried that I was making a really bad decision to work in Sydney and leave my children and my husband in Mongo. Um, and I understood that came from a good place. But she didn't understand it. She didn't understand why we were making the call we did. Um, so there were moments where I thought, yeah, is this wrong? Am I just wired crazily? Like, why am I doing this? Um, but I remember talking to Steph. She was in year 10. And I said to her, Steph, have you ever felt sad that you didn't have a mother who stayed at home and made muffins? She said, yeah, Mum, sometimes I did. But she said, now I'm older. She said, I've watched you, and I, you have taught me more about being a strong woman than anyone I know, and I'm glad you didn't make muffins. Yeah. I, I think, proud of my children in that, the things that I did actually gave them other opportunities. When they were very little, they went to daycare, with Maggie DeRoy, some of you might know Maggie DeRoy. Maggie DeRoy was a blessing to our family. I have these two little children, and I'm a neat freak, and everything's got to be clean and tidy and ordered, and that's how we play, and that's how we do things, and we read books silently together. <laughs> well, not at Maggie DeRoy's house. At Maggie DeRoy's house, you're into science and experiments and, and growing things in the garden and finger painting in her kitchen. She had six children of other families in the children all finger painting. I would no more do that than why. <laughs> she would put them all in the car and take them to the beach and they'd get sand in every orifice. <laughs> and then they would come home. And I'm thinking, how does this woman do this? She was a gift to our family because they actually got more from their time with Maggie than they would have if I'd stayed at home and made muffins and tidied them up constantly. <laughs> so guilt? They, they actually had opportunity because I did what I did. You just got to reframe. I think Kathy's not It could be hard, I know, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing hard. Um, it seems to me that often when women get together, uh, we hear what I actually think it would be even more valuable for men to hear. Um, and I'd love to hear men. I'd love men to hear you talking about women in leadership. But I'm interested in your input into boys in your school to help them in their understanding of women. Yeah, that's a really great question. Of women. It was really funny when I, because I've had lots of experience in girls' schools and some in co ed. Um, when I arrived at Barker, I'd come from St Mary's. And I took on a year eight class halfway through the year, so they weren't even my class. And it was a, like a new experience. Uh, Barker it has gone fully co ed, uh, but because its journey has just begun, it's fully co ed, the ratio is a bit uh, 
skewed. So we have maybe 70 to 30. So 70% boys, 30% girls. So I'm in this class, mostly boys. And they're a great class, lots of, lots of fun. But there were these four boys who would always sit up the front and they had to punch each other. And they're punching and they're pushing and they're throwing and they're doing all this. One day I just went and said, what are you boys doing? Why do you do this? And they looked at me and said, we don't know, miss, but we just have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the question is, what am I teaching the boys? I think the boys are teaching me too. Um, I think... Um, there's, there's a little bit at Barker where the boys often say, hi sir, hi sir, hi sir, and they just walk past you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm teaching year 12 at the moment, and the boys in the front row uh, are hilarious. Again, they're not punching each other, but they're punching each other with words. <laughs> and one of them said, you're a doctor. I said, yeah, I'm a doctor. And he said, it's nice to meet you, doctor. <laughs> and so I call him, uh, his surname is Petey, and I say, how are you, Dr. Petey? And good on you, doctor. And we kind of just joke with one another. Boys love to have a joke. And I think if I can, if I call something out with them about how they treat girls or how they treat the women teachers differently, I will sometimes do it through a joke. And I will sometimes try and get uh, them to understand something through humour. And they actually learn more. Um, it's lots of fun. It's... It's incredibly fun. Um, and they're good boys. <coughs> On their own, they're good boys. In big rugby teams, they're frightening. <laughs> So not always just the, um, the easy times. So I'm just going to pray. Let's just pray. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Julie and for, for David and for them coming down all the way from Hornsby to be with us tonight. Thank you so much for the way you've been with Julie and David um, through their married life and through Julie's and David's careers. And um, I thank you for each woman in this room I thank you that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I just pray, Lord, um, that each of us would think about that, would think about where you've placed us, what passions you've put inside us, whether in this season you're asking us to have fortitude in a particular way. So, Lord, help us to not just um, think about this as a nice talk, but how you might be wanting to shine a light on something in our life, whether it's just to, to know how valuable we are. Just pray that we'll each search our heart and, uh, and turn this into something positive in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So feel free to talk. I'm sure she will be here just for a couple more minutes, maybe not too many more, but if you wanted to come and chat with her. And we really hope to see you next week up at Mount Kimberley. Thank you.